Amen. I speak in the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's always great when you get up to a pulpit and you see two or three other sermons laying around and you kind of wonder if that's a sign that this one's not any good, that you should pick up one of those and read it. Ah, who knows. Anyway, today's Stewardship Sunday. At least that's what we proclaim it here at St. Paul's. Stewardship is about being grateful, responsible stewards of the gifts that we receive from God. The tradition of giving back to God and to the church comes from the biblical practice of tithing, which means to give back a tenth of our earnings to God. This comes from the book of Numbers. The Episcopal Church sees stewardship as more than simply contributing money to the church. It is also about contributing time and talents and volunteering for ministry and mission. It's about reaching out to build relationships from a perspective of abundance instead of scarcity. That's a, it's just a bit dry to me, it seems. I mean, it's all true, but surely there's more to that. Years ago when I was in St. Louis, you recall Jack Danforth was a three-time senator from the state of Missouri and also an Episcopal priest. And, and as you know, some of you remember that when Jack was in Kansas City on a Sunday, St. Paul's is where he and Sally worshipped. He helped me out at the little church I was serving in St. Louis, and I, I've told this before, and you may remember it, but I, I asked Jack uh, when, one Sunday when he was preaching if he'd preach about stewardship, much the way I'm trying to do this morning. And Jack got up in our pul pulpit and said, Steve asked me to preach about stewardship. I'm for it. And that was it. Then he said what he wanted to do. I guess if you're somebody like Jack Danforth, you get to do that. Anyway, it's been always historically for a lot of clergy, this is an uncomfortable sermon to preach um, because we're kind of trying to raise the money, if you will, for our own salary. Not so much these days, but it certainly felt that way in the past. I know I've rehearsed the um, uh, historical uh, perspective of giving in the Episcopal Church, but I'd like to remind us of that, because I think it's important to see where we came from and where we're going. In the pre-revolutionary war time period, taxes were collected for the church, to support the church, where it was established. This was basically for clergy uh, support. Uh, the Congregationalists, the Puritans, um, were established in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. The Anglicans, who are our predecessors, were in New York, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. Rhode Island and Pennsylvania were the two states that did not have uh, an established church. Alms were collected. If you've ever been to any English churches, sometimes they still have uh, wooden alms boxes that are screwed into the wall. Um, and they were collected to help for, poor re for the relief of the poor and to also support clergy salaries. At the end of the year, towards the end of the year, bills were sent out to all the members of the church to cover the maintenance issues of the uh, building and its upkeep. In the post-revolutionary period, these taxes um, and alms were, were, were replaced by what we call pew rents. It was a common practice in the Roman Catholic Church for Presbyterians and Anglicans and became the primary source of income. Pews, if you've ever traveled abroad, you will see many more churches with pews in this country than in Europe. It's because they were used as a major source of income for American churches. The free church movement started uh, somewhere at the end of the 19th century, or maybe the middle of it. Um, it was to replace pew rents, and it began first among our Presbyterian brothers and sisters. William Augustus Muhlenberg, Bishop Jackson Kemper, who was uh, uh, strategic in this part of the world, and G.H. Doane met in Philadelphia. They had a common interest in mission work and this new Presbyterian idea. In 1832, Doane became the Bishop of New Jersey, and he declared that all nine churches in that diocese, there are 161 now, to be free churches. In 1843 to 1846, Muhlenberg obtained gifts to build the Church of the Holy Communion in New York City. It was the first purpose-built free church in the Diocese of New York. About 10 years later, the Church of the Holy Communion 
was established as a free church in St. Louis. The free church movement grew throughout the 19th century. The model was that, that parishioners would call on other parishioners on Sunday afternoons uh, to, to get their pledges to be turned in. It was that time when you assumed that everybody was at home on Sunday afternoons because there was no Chiefs football or, or anything else like that. And this lasted well into the 20th century. Things started to change in the early 1920s, I guess, when you had the Ecumen Ecumenical Council on Stewardship, and we began to emphasize the notion of the tithe, tithe being 10% of the income. In Genesis 14, we're told that every Jew was required by the Levitical law to pay three tithes of his property. One tithe for the Levites, who were the clergy, if you will. One was for the use of the temple and the great feasts, and one was for the poor of the land. Of the land. This, this, this paying attention of spiritual gi giving of spiritual benefits of giving were enhanced in the later part of the century in 1969 when we come upon the Alabama plan. Bishop Furman Stow was a bishop of Al Alabama. He focused on uh, exclusively on the tithe on 10%. About half of his parishes adopted this plan. It meant that the clergy and vestry of the parish were committed to tithing as part of their leadership. Often an outside consultant was used. 25% of the parish were trained as volunteers and the need for, for, for a tithe and what that meant to your spiritual life. And then they would go out and call on three other people. It became, it became known as the Star Plan and Bishop Stow became the presiding bishop's assistant for stewardship. And really the Alabama plan uh, became the plan, the model for the entire church at some level. Today we know that about 40% of average parishioners are givers of record, and about 55% only give in loose, loose offerings, if at all. We know a lot about the generations and how they give. For instance, the boomers, my generation, the older boomers are stronger contributors than the younger boomers. The silent generation, those who are between 75 and 92, were loyalists and committed to the church and committed supporting it with their money. The GIs, Gen X, Gen Y, the millennials, Gen, Gen Z, Generation Z, the boomlets, that they sometimes are known as the new silent generation, all have different patterns of giving, how much and what they decide to give. At our last Fester meeting um, a few days ago, we talked a little bit about stewardship and um, a couple of Vestry members uh, said that I should preach the best sermon I've ever preached. And as Jonathan and I both know, sometimes we fall into our best sermons not knowing if they're very good or not. Uh, so I'm not to claim this is my best, uh, or even if it is very effective when it comes to stewardship. Anyway, I once, I know, the rector of one of the largest Episcopal churches in the country. He has an annual budget north of six or seven million dollars. Their average uh, stewardship campaign nets somewhere between four and a half and five million dollars. They obviously operate on a different scale to almost everyone else in the country. But I did ask him his secret to the success. How did he get so much money in stewardship? And he said, there are no magic wands there's no magic sermons, there's no best sermons. He said, you simply have to be honest and transparent in communicating the needs of the parish and the ministries that stewardship supports. He said, you need not be shy about talking about money. Others in stewardship are almost on the opposite side. When it comes to stewardship, they almost do not ever mention needs are, and are unwilling to talk about money. They focus entirely on the spiritual giving, giving back to God in thanksgiving for what we have received. Others talk only about the 10%, the tithe, as in the Alabama plan. The minimum Christian responsibility in anything over 10% is what they call giving. Lindsay and I started out about giving one or two percent of our income to the church. Uh, I always suggest to people 
that you pick out a percentage if you want to do, and one, two, three, four, whatever percentage points, and give it back to the church. Over the years, we were able to increase every year, at least most every year, by half a percentage point or a full point. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, we've worked up our way into giving 10% of our income to the church. That's just what we did. The highest we ever gave was one year we managed to give 12%. Um, but that only happened once or twice. But some years were tough. We could not fulfill our commitment to a 10% tithe, for instance, during the years our daughter was in college. College was just more expensive than we had anticipated. And then again, after retirement, it has become difficult to fulfill our commitment to a 10% tithe because life is now just simply very different and trying to learn how to live that life is different. So I don't know that all there is to know about stewardship, far from it. But what I do know is that this place, St. Paul's, and places like this church are important to the vast scheme of creation and worthy of our financial support. This, this is a place of great beauty, a place where sacred music lifts the soul, a place that takes seriously the call to help our neighbors, a place where we encounter the divine, a place where we meet the holy, week after week after week. It is a place wherein we can contemplate our search for meaning. We search for a good self to be and for good work to do. We search to become human in a world that tempts us always to be less than human or looks to us to be more. We search to love and be loved. And in a world where it is often hard to believe in much of anything, we search to believe in something holy and beautiful and a life transcending that will give meaning and purpose to the lives we live. We search to believe in something holy and beautiful and life transcending that will give meaning and purpose to the lives we live. Amen. Amen.